In chapter 11, we're going to move away from inference on a single population parameter into inference on two population parameters. So that means we're going to be making confidence intervals, sample size calculations, and hypothesis tests, but on two groups instead of a single group like we were doing in chapters 9 and 10. Now before we get into inference about two population proportions, which is of course very important, we need to be able to distinguish between the types of sampling that we're doing because that will dictate to us what type of hypothesis test confidence interval we can make. Now there's two types of sampling that we're going to be looking at. There's independent sampling, when the individuals selected for one sample do not dictate or have any relationship really with the individuals in the second sample. And then there's dependent sampling, which is also known as matched pair sampling. That's when the individuals selected to be in one sample can be used or are used to determine the individuals in the second sample. Now it is possible for one individual to be matched against themselves. So if you think of a pre-test and a post-test, that's dependent sampling. So when you have one group measured twice, that is dependent sampling right here. So dependent sampling can be the same persons, like so you have a group of people and you measure them before and you measure them after, right? So if you look at these two right here, so if you think pre-test and post-test, if you think of before and after, right, that's a group of people measured against themselves. But you can also have people that are related to each other. So if you have husbands and wives, or heck, spouses and spouses, <laughs> that would work, right? So people that are related, um, they don't have to be married. They could be um, twins. Twins are very common, actually. Siblings, relatives of, of certain types, right? Then once you pick one twin, then the other twin has to be selected. So it's where individuals in one group affect the next group, right? Because if you want to have siblings, then once you pick one sibling, then the other sibling has to be in there, right? Again, the most common ones we use are actually these ones up here. These are um, pre and post and before and after. But the other ones are also possible. Now, independent sampling would be when you have two groups measured one time. So two separate groups that don't have anything to do with each other. So you could actually think of, um, instead of independent here, you could say separate. So those are two separate groups that are measured once, right? So if you have unrelated men and women, um, unrelated people in general, so unrelated groups, right? Then it could be unrelated um, men and women, unrelated women and women, unrelated men and men, whatever, right? unrelated people, unrelated giraffes, you know, it doesn't make any difference, but it has to be two separate groups that have nothing to do with each other that are measured one time. And I have a little drawing here for you. So a dependent sample takes from one larger population to samples. So that could be the sample of people pre and post, or it could be a sample of um, married people, spouse one, spouse two, right? That would work, All right? So you could say married people here, and you could say spouse one here, and spouse two here. That would work, right? Or another example, you could say, just to give a second example, you could have a group of students. And of course, there's infinitely many examples. I'm just kind of making up one here. So if you have a group of students, you could have them take a before um, well, you could have them take a test before, a quiz before, or you could have them take um, their blood pressure before or their body temperature before, and then you have them do exercise and then have them check it after. Right? So there's a couple examples of a dependent sample. Now, an independent sample would be, for example, um, let's say you have a group of um, one type of student and a group of another type of student that don't have anything to do with each other. So you could have MSU students. I'm in Michigan, so that's Michigan State University to me. And um, I don't know, Jackson College students where I work and where you're probably attending school if you're watching this, right? 
two separate groups. They don't really have anything to do with each other. I mean, you might have one student that attends both eventually, but that you wouldn't be sampling them at that time. And then sample one gets their, I don't know, um, their annual income. which I realize is small for students because you're students, but you know, the IRS still asks, right? So the annual income for these students versus the annual income for these students, right? I think that's one of the things that the financial aid forms asks, right? That would work. Or let's see here. Um, we could give you another example just for fun. And no, there's no real reason to color these the same way. I just was. So you could say, um, these are a random group of men. These are a random group of women. And you ask them a certain question. Like, um, have you ever been married? So you can, you can count the number of men that are married. So have you been married? Have you ever been married? <laughs> That's another one. And then same thing here. So it doesn't have to just be a number, although that's a possibility. You could also be asking them questions, right? And then these are two separate things, right? So these are unrelated men and women. They don't have anything to do with each other. So asking these, you know, random 100 men if they've ever been married doesn't really have any bearing on have you ever married for these women because they're not related to each other. They're not spouses. Whereas if they were spouses, that would be a whole different thing. Now, keeping that in mind, let's see if we can put it into practice with an example. All right, so we're gonna determine whether the sampling method is independent or dependent, and then we're gonna determine whether the response variable is quantitative or qualitative. Now, if I look back here to the ones I was asking here, um, I didn't really get into it over here on the left, but over here on the right, this is quantitative, right? When I'm talking about annual income, that's quantitative. That's a numerical thing, right? How much money do you make? Have you ever been married is qualitative because people will say yes or no, and you're turning it into a proportion. So this will be proportions and quantitative turns into means. Oops, I wrote on the next page. Oh my goodness, that was bad. There you go, <laughs> I ran out of space there. All right, quantitative, so this will be means. So that's why we ask that, because proportion ones will be qualitative and quantitative ones are means. So means ones are quantitative, proportion ones are qualitative. All right, back we go to our example. So we conduct a survey of 100 random men and 100 random women to find out which was their favorites, um, excuse me, their favorite Summer Olympic sport to watch on TV. Well, right there, men and women that are random. These people are unrelated to each other. These are two separate groups. And if they're two separate groups, then that means that it's independent. So it's either independent quantitative or independent qualitative. But the thing we're asking about is what their favorite Olympic sport is. So basketball or swimming or gymnastics, which is my personal favorite, that's, that's a word, right? That's qualitative. And that means that we're doing this one. It's independent and it's qualitative. Now, qualitative will mean proportions. So if you're on a calculator, it would be two prop Z test and two prop Z int. These are the proportion ones and qualitative is proportions. All right, let's move on to the next one. We again have 100 random men and 100 random women and we've polled them to find out whether they like watching the Olympics on TV or not. Ah, so it seems like it's going to be independent, but we read on. We first call them the day before the games start, and then we do a follow-up call after the Olympics end. That's before and after. Yeah? So that's before and after, so that is classic dependent. So it's either dependent quantitative or qualitative. Now, what were we asking them? We were asking them whether they like the Olympics on TV or not. So when you respond to that, you'll be saying, yes, I like it. No, I don't, <laughs> right? So that is dependent and it's qualitative. So it's actually this one over here. Now, the trick is that even though you're thinking that's qualitative, which it is, that's qualitative, 
It's dependent qualitative, which we are not going to do. Dependent qualitative is actually chapter 12. So it's not one of the options. It's actually none of these. Because a dependent qualitative ties to this one. It's chapter 12, which we are not obviously covering in chapter 11. These three options are chapter 11 options. This is 11.1. This is 11.2. This is 11.3. All right, so now a researcher wants to know if a basketball or soccer player weighs more. A random sample of male college basketball players and a random sample of male college soccer players were obtained and weighed. Well, that's two separate groups. I mean, these are random male college basketball players and random, they don't even have to be at the same school, right? So these are two separate groups, the soccer and the basketball. So two separate groups. So it's got to be independent. So it's either independent qualitative or quantitative. And then we're weighing them on a scale. Well, that's quantitative, right? That has a number, right? You know how much you weigh when you step on a scale because it has a number attached to it, right? Therefore, it's independent and quantitative. Independent quantitative will be this one. This is section 11.3. That's the one that's independent and quantitative. And if you're interested, this one is section 11.1. .1. This one right here. All right, so section 11.3, independent quantitative will be there, be the last um, major new section for chapter 11. All right, now a researcher collected data showing the heart rates beats per minute for a random sample of coffee drinkers before they drink coffee and also 15 minutes after. Well, I mean, I mean, if you're going to put the words right in there, before and after, hello, dependent, that's dependent, right? Now, what are we measuring? Well, we're measuring their beats per minute. That's something you measure, that's quantitative, right? So it's before and after, before and after is classic matched pairs, right? That is dependent and it's quantitative, which is this section right here. It's section 11.2 when we're gonna deal with dependent samples. So you might've noticed we're actually only gonna deal with dependent samples in one section. That's 11.2, dependent samples for a mean. And then we're going to deal with two different sections, 11.1 and 11.3, that are for independent samples. And then the other dependent one we're not going to cover in Chapter 11. That would be Chapter 12 if we went on that far. Or if you're going that far in the particular semester you're watching this. But remember as you do these to look for the key things like before and after, because that's giving you dependent right here. Start and a follow-up call that's dependent. Whereas over here, well, up here at the top, these random men and random women, and then there's no before and after. This one has random men and women as well, but there was a before and after attached to it. But this one doesn't, and so that's why this is independent. And down here, they were random bas ba basketball, sorry, <laughs> I was going to say baseball, and random soccer players. So that's why it's independent. And they're not doing a before or after thing with them, they're just measuring them once. Two separate groups measured once, that's independent. One group measured twice, that's dependent. 